As you know, our topic tonight is Cuba Today, Revolution and Reform, a topic which our, our guest has dealt with for a long time and with considerable passion and enthusiasm. We're delighted that he is uh, speaking to the topic. Um, Professor Feinberg was, uh, is a graduate of Brown University. He did uh, in history. He did uh, further work in history at, I believe, uh, University College and uh, London University. And uh, later he get his uh, PhD was from Stanford in uh, international economy. Uh, interestingly, um, he was in the Peace Corps in Chile. Uh, and it was during the time of the success of Mr. Allende being elected. And as a young man at age 24, he wrote a very well-received book Triumph of Allende, describing that election. And for a young man, that's an extraordinary thing to do. And uh, everything in his career, I think, has had a similar uh, shine of, of, of excellence. Um, he uh, um, had an early stint with the Treasury. Uh, and he worked in the Office of, of uh, uh, Development of, of Small Nations national development. And, uh, and then he also later was with the uh, uh, policy planning staff at State, where he was responsible for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, two really quite impressive early jobs. The policy planning staff, as all of you know, is a very elite institution uh, within the Department of, of State. Uh, and then during that period of time, he received his PhD from, from Stanford. Uh, he worked for a decade at one of the major development uh, companies, corporations, and uh, followed that up with a, a shorter stint as um, uh, president, I believe, of Inter-America Dialogue, a very prestigious organization for a discussion among the true leaders of the hemisphere uh, from all walks and, of life and professions. Uh, his next uh, period in a sense, was with the Clinton administration. And in it, he uh, was the, uh, he headed the Office of Latin America, Western Hemisphere Affairs, Inter-American uh, Affairs, as senior director at the National Security Council, which made him the president's senior advisor on Latin America. Uh, those were extraordinary posts. And in 1996, following that, uh, experience in government. He uh, joined the University of California, San Diego, uh, in 1996, where he's been ever since. He's the author of over 200 books and articles, um, and many of them very, very good. <laughs> uh, he, during his career, he received at least a half a dozen major fellowships. Each one is, was extraordinary honor, extraordinarily honorific. He's been an advisor to major foundations, such as the Ford Foundation and, uh, and other groups. Um, his experience is wide. One thing that catches my attention, of course, though, is in his current position at San Diego, he's taught a number of courses on an ongoing basis. And uh, he's taught about the uh, the making of American foreign policy, which draws the civic order into the, the considerations. Uh, he's taught on Latin America in general, and uh, uh, he's been concerned with corporate responsibility within the system, and he's taught a course on Cuba, reformation or, or revolution and reform. So it's a long-standing uh, interest of his. Uh, I think we're extraordinarily fortunate I should say most of you already know him because he's the, uh, the book reviewer for the Western Hemisphere section of Foreign Affairs Quarterly, uh, an extraordinary journal, as you know, and uh, it's quite an honor to, to do that. But a lot of people know you from that. It's my great pleasure to present uh, Professor Richard E. Feinberg. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. That was a really very, very kind and generous introduction. 
Uh, and it's wonderful to be here in Baltimore. I had a chance to walk around the Inner Harbor. Uh, I love those old sailing ships, and you have it here all the time. I hope you get a chance from time to time to take it out for a sail, right? <laughs> Make sure it's still in operating order. Yeah. OK. Um, I spent quite a bit of time on ships myself. I was always fascinated by ships, actually, even as a young boy. And then I was able to get a job at the age of 18 on uh, transatlantic passenger ships, working uh, you know, at the most menial possible jobs as an 18-year-old. I, I didn't even make it the dishwasher. I was the assistant dishwasher. <laughs> But the arc of my career can be traced when just about uh, four, 50 years later, I was invited to uh, take a two-week sail on a US aircraft carrier uh, to lecture on security issues, the, uh, the, the uh, officer corps. And I was invited to dine at the admiral's table. I thought, wow, Richard, you know, you've come a long way. <laughs> So, um, but I'm here to talk a bit about Cuba. And uh, I was in uh, Panama for the recent Summit of the Americas uh, in April. I love summits. I've, there have been seven inter-American summits since the first one was launched in 1994. And I've been to six out of the seven. I am a summiteer. I don't know that anyone else can claim that distinction, because uh, I was part of the original uh, 1994 summit when I was working for uh, President Clinton. Uh, so at the Panama summit, this was the first time that the Cubans were invited. And uh, all the heads of state were up on a podium, and it was Raul Castro's time to talk. And first Raul says, you know, uh, we're all, we've all given eight minutes to talk. But since this is the first time I've been invited, I figure I'm entitled to seven times eight. <laughs> So I get 56 minutes. So that was an opening uh, light remark, broke the ice a little bit. But then he went on to talk for about 50 minutes <laughs> to, to give his version of US foreign policy and inter-American relations. And as you can imagine, uh, his views are the views that he's always held, uh, which, you know, sort of hard hitting, uh, the problems in Cuba were the result of American imperialism and all this. I thought, oh my God, this is terrible. I mean, he's taking this, this wonderful opportunity and he's just uh, driving it into the ground. But then all of a sudden he stops and he turns to President Obama and he says, Mr. President, I know you're, you're, you're a relatively young man and I absolve you of all the sins of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he says, Mr. President, I have read your books. Okay, not every word, but I've definitely looked them over. And I think, he says to the American president, I think you are an honest man. And moreover, I think that you come from humble origins and you have remained true to those humble origins. And coming from a guy from Cuba, that was very high praise indeed. And it was particularly important because Cuban foreign policy has been based on the idea of hostility with the United States since the revolution. And with the basic idea that you, know, you can't trust any major American leader, they're all out to get us. And suddenly he was dissolving that image and saying, this man who's been president of the United States for six years and with whom I am making historic agreements is somebody that I, and therefore we, the Cubans, can do business with in a trustworthy way. So it was a major moment in inter-American relations, and I was very excited to be there for that. I also happened to have been in Cuba on December 17th, and that was the day in which uh, I was attending a conference uh, at, at the Diplomatic Center in Havana. And suddenly we get the word, there's about to be an announcement, and they huddle all of us from the conference. There were about 10 Americans and about 200 Cubans. These were mostly people from the Diplomatic Corps or, or senior students who were planning to join uh, the Cuban Foreign Service. So, you know, these are middle class, educated people. 
and we wonder what's going to happen. We thought there might be some announcement, but we didn't know the exact content. So, of course, uh, so there were simultaneous announcements from the two presidents. Being in Cuba, of course, first they showed President Raul Castro, and he says, well, first we have, I have a very wonderful announcement. We have arranged this spy swap in which they're releasing an American that they were holding, Alan Gross, in return for uh, the United States is giving up uh, people that they had referred to as the heroes of the revolution. Uh, these five people, there were three left then, who had been in US jails uh, since the late 90s. So from his point of view, and this was a big issue they had highlighted throughout Cuba, there were billboards everywhere. So this was a big triumph of Cuban foreign policy from his perspective. But then he went on to say, and this was the shocker, and President Obama and I have decided to normalize diplomatic relations. And when he said that, there's this huge gasp in the Cuban audience. <gasps> and then everybody stands up and starts cheering hysterically. And people start embracing each other and really crying. And suddenly, they all burst out spontaneously and sing the Cuban national anthem. That's how emotional and important an announcement this was for them. Suddenly they saw 50 years of hostility with their very large neighbor uh, evaporating. They could see the sun coming through the clouds for the first time in their lives, most of them. That was followed by they then showed Obama, who uh, essentially made similar remarks, uh, underscoring and sh showing very clearly that both leaders had decided to march uh, in this very new direction. So we are at a very historic turning point, not only for U.S.-Cuban relations, but for inter-American relations in general. It, in Panama, uh, without a doubt, all of the Latin Americans, right, left, and center, applauded this move towards normalization of diplomatic relations with Cuba. And it, it turned Obama into real, really the hero of the hour. And this is very interesting from a foreign policy perspective, because prior to this, Cuba was a thorn in the relations of the United States to Latin America. Forever we were being criticized for our you know, uh, heavy-handed policies. And so that was a big problem. And this move in US relations with Cuba turns what was a, a serious thorn in our relations to a moment of triumph for American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the hemisphere. Only a president can do that. Only a president uh, can make such a dramatic decision and then public announcement to 180 degrees turn around American foreign policy. So that's what's going on. I'll come back to that in a minute in terms of where we are exactly on US-Cuban relations. Let me talk a bit about what's going on inside Cuba today. So Raul Castro came in uh, 2006, first when his brother Fidel was ill, then formally in 2008 he does become president of Cuba. Fidel is basically rarely seen. The assumption is that he's quite ill. Uh, nobody knows exactly what his illness is. Uh, that's how tight Cuban security is. Uh, but without a doubt, he's, he's seriously ill and is sidelined. So Raul is in charge. And Raul has begun this gradual process of transforming the economy. So he's allowed the bit of a private sector, small scale private sectors. If you want to open up a restaurant, if you have some money, uh, if you want to run a small taxi service, if you want to open up a beauty parlor, uh, these, uh, a, a shop that repairs electronic goods, a small construction company, um, these are the types of things you can do. And there's a list of 201 activities that are allowed in the small scale private sector. 500,000 Cubans quickly avail themselves of this new opportunity. That's out of a workforce of 5 million. So immediately 10% of the Cuban uh, workforce says, yeah, we're going to try something in the private sector. More recently, they've said you could also set up uh, cooperatives. And they've allowed uh, several hundred uh, cooperatives. Uh, and that's just beginning. We'll see how that, how that develops. They've also said they're going, but still, most of the economy is in the hands of the government or state-owned enterprises, the vast majority. So there's anything you, major you see out here, major hotel chains, talking about a shipping company, talking about the banks, anything, that would all, educational institutions, of course, that would all be government in Cuba. Uh, and uh, that's still the case. What they're saying is they're going to allow each of these state-owned enterprises 
to make a little more of their own decisions. They're not just going to be told what to do from the central government. We'll see if that happens. But that's still uh, a form of, of socialism. Uh, Raul has said that Cubans who do own their own homes or apartments, but were not allowed to sell them before, now can sell them. Uh, so all of a sudden, Cubans who basically, since there are no capital markets, there are really no banks, there's no stock market or anything like that, there's no shares, uh, Cubans basically have no financial assets. Uh, all of a sudden, their house and their apartment became a financial asset, which they could sell. And that immediately, dramatically increased the wealth of many, many Cubans. And so now there is a market in real estate. They could also buy and sell um, their cars. For, uh, they could have cell phones. Uh, they're gradually opening up internet opportunities, although it's still very restricted. And most important for your average Cuban, it used to be to leave the island, you need a special permit. And that special permit was not easy to get. That was you were essentially imprisoned on the island. Uh, and it's not that, you know, it's a medium-sized island. I mean, it would be as though, I mean, we know, you know, Maryland's a wonderful state, but suppose you couldn't go, you couldn't leave Maryland. I mean, that would be a little frustrating, right? Well, that was the situation for the average Cuban. Couldn't leave the island. That's changed. Any Cuban, if you can afford it, uh, can, almost any Cuban can now travel. Uh, you just, your problem now is not getting out of Cuba, it's getting a visa to go to another country. That's the, that might be an obstacle, but that's true for you know, anyone traveling anywhere. So there have been these important liberalizations uh, in the economic area. But it still remains a socialist, by and large, planned economy on the whole. It's, these private enterprise people, they still suffer under and work under a lot of restrictions. Very hard to get credit, hard to get inputs. There aren't uh, uh, wholesale markets that are readily available. Uh, you cannot import yourself. Uh, if you have a restaurant, for example, you can only have 50 chairs. That's it. Not 51, just 50. And government inspectors will come and count the chairs. Uh, basically, the idea, it seems so petty, right? But the idea is they don't want people getting really rich. You can be, oh, you can be uh, comfortable, but they don't want really rich people in the private sector. And why don't they want really rich people in the private sector? Because they figure if you have a lot of money, that becomes a pillar for power. And they don't want a private sector that could challenge the monopoly of the Communist Party. So, plus, they, have, they still have these ideas about inequality. They don't want really rich people and, you know, who will be exploiting. They still have those uh, very traditional, traditional socialist values. They say they want foreign investment. They recently passed a new foreign investment law. They built uh, uh, an area. The Brazilians paid for it uh, to open up uh, for foreign investment, a uh, free trade zone sort of thing. So far, they've had very few uh, offers. Why? Uh, if you want to hire a worker in Cuba, you can't just like put an ad in the newspaper and say, hey, come on, let's come work for me. You have to go through a state employment agency. That state employment agency chooses your workers and pretty well also sets the salaries. And when you pay the worker, you don't pay the worker directly. You pay the state employment agency, who in turn pays the worker, and takes a huge tax out of what you paid him. So that's, and there are many other issues, I, I won't go into all the details, but so your average international company uh, is not too enthusiastic yet about investing in Cuba. So they still have a lot of reforms they need to undertake uh, if they are really going to have a more dynamic and more open economy. Uh, on the political side, make no mistake, it's still a one-party state. You cannot form another political party. You cannot hold demonstrations on the street. Forget it. Uh, you'll, you'll be told you can't do it. If you don't stop, you'll likely end up in jail or you know, maybe beaten up. You won't be shot, though. I mean, they're, relatively speaking, this is an authoritarian as opposed to a totalitarian regime. Uh, you can, if you want, uh, invite some friends over uh, to your house and have a political discussion, and that probably will be tolerated. Uh, it's not a great idea to go around saying you don't like Raul Castro or Fidel Castro, and you should be a little careful. Uh, but there is now room for quiet uh, discussion. You can certainly criticize the economy. You can go to seminars at the, uh, political, science, at the uh, political science or economics departments or think tanks in Cuba, and they will have active discussions about what to do, with what the problems are, and 
a way forward. So there is the beginnings of, uh, of an intellectual or political discourse on the island, but within bounds. As I say, you cannot form a political opposition. They do say, Raul has said, that there will be important constitutional reforms over the next year. But what those would be, nobody knows. This is still the thing about Cuba. It's still very non-transparent. Yeah, normally, you'd think if there's going to be a constitutional reform, there would be a big public debate. No, people have to wait to see what the Communist Party wants to do. And then, once that decision is made, then they can then have a public discussion. So uh, the, the mass media is still totally controlled by the government. But you do now have, within the internet, people, some people have blogs, private magazines. That's beginning to percolate up, beginning. And it'll be fascinating to see over the next five years, as the internet and smartphones really spread on the island, uh, what effect that might have. I was recently in Vietnam, which is, of course, is still a one-party state. But everybody has cell phones, and Facebook is the rage. And people, in fact, it's, so, it's such that you go to a dinner party and no one's talking anymore. They're just playing with their Facebook page, you know? <laughs> Sound familiar? Right. Yeah, so that's what's going on. And, but the political impact of that has to be tremendous eventually because it means people have sources of information and the ability to socially network apart from government control. And I think something like that you will begin to see happen uh, over the next five years in Cuba. So that's the situation on the ground. So let me now just return and, and finish up my formal remarks with a discussion of where we are U.S.-Cuba relations. So, in it, so in it, uh, the president said we, we're going to normalize diplomatic relations. Now, the diplomatic relations I have to underscore because they did not say normalize relations. That is to say we still have trade sanctions and, and investment sanctions. And if you have companies, you cannot invest in Cuba. Don't. Get that wrong, you're unallowed by the US government. No US investments allowed in Cuba. Nor are you allowed to trade with state owned enterprises except in a few specialized areas uh, in, the, in certain agricultural and pharmaceutical areas. Basically, they're also uh, off, uh, off limits. What President Obama did say, though, is that we, the US government, want to support empowering the people in the private sector. So these 500,000 people who work in the private sector, authorized by the Cuban government, they have their licenses, uh, the, President Obama said, American firms can trade with them, buy and sell. He also said that there was one exception to not being allowed to trade with state-owned enterprises, and that's in the telecom and IT sector. All of that is held by a state monopoly in Cuba but with the idea that the internet would be an injection of freedom into Cuba, that American firms are now free to sell to that state-owned enterprise, software, hardware, whatever. Those two offers of trade with the private sector and trade with the telecom monopoly, the Cubans have not yet responded. There have been some bilateral discussions on the telecom side, nothing yet decided, no deals done. With regard to uh, selling into the private sector, uh, the difficulty there is these firms don't have the capacity or the authority to engage in international trade. And any trade in Cuba does have to go through state trading monopolies. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the US executive branch did clarify that, OK, yes, American firms can sell through those state-owned trading monopolies in order to sell into the private sector in Cuba. So if you. Uh, produce bricks, and you want to sell to a private construction company in Cuba, you are now authorized to do that by the US government. Uh, I'm aware, though, of very few such deals that have actually been able to materialize. That on the Cuban side, figuring out how to work through all those layers of bureaucracy uh, still to be navigated. Then there's also the issue of credit. Uh, there, there's no Cuban banks. Uh, American firms are not yet granting trade credits to any Cuban entity. Maybe you could arrange a trade credit directly uh, with your company uh, that would not directly involve uh, Cuba. That might be possible. But there's a missing piece of this. So there are two missing pieces. One, how to figure out exactly the details of how to sell into the Cuban market. And the other is, normally since trade moves on credit, how would you handle the finances? So those are issues to be resolved. Uh, on the normalization of relations, we're all waiting. Uh, 
It's been six months since, uh, since December. Uh, there are lots of rumors floating around that they're about to reach final agreement on the details any day. The main holdup has been we run certain democracy promotion programs, uh, USAID and the State Department. Uh, we provide various resources to people we consider Democrats or in the, in the case of Cuba, dissidents. Uh, uh, we give them training, we give them access to the internet, we give them some funds. This is not entirely transparent, by the way, on our part. If you go to the website, it's hard to find the details of these programs, which is an issue. Uh, so from the Cuban point of view, this looks like espionage because these people that we're providing money to that we say are dissidents, they say are subversives. Some, they may even call them terrorists, you know, if they really want to slander them. So uh, there's a different view of the quality of those personalities. And so basically the Cuban government has said, we don't want the US government mucking around in our internal affairs, and we want you to stop using the embassy as a channel to provide resources to, to the people who are trying to overthrow our government. And that's been the sticking point. I have to assume there is some way to find a compromise on that issue, and I expect that compromise will be announced shortly, but that's been the sticking point. So a lot of rumors are floating around that any day now there'll be an announcement that details have been worked out. Uh, in Havana, they, are, they have been putting up, it's under construction, the, the tall flagpole right in front of what was the U.S. Embassy before the revolution and is now an interest section. And we expect that as soon as that announcement is made, Secretary of State John Kerry will fly down to Havana. It's only three hours from Washington, D.C. There will be a ceremony, and he will raise the American flag over the U.S. Embassy in Havana for the first time since 1961. And that there will be a similar ceremony in Washington, D.C. on, uh, on uh, 16th Street, uh, you know, right up. Uh, for, you know, from the Cuban embassy, you can look right down to the White House. It's up on a hill, I mean, it's, uh, and, that eventually, and that there will be a similar ceremony, I assume, in which the Cuban foreign minister comes and raises the Cuban flag. And that, <coughs> those, that would be an historic moment. So uh, we expect that to happen. What's going to happen next? I think part of it depends on the Cubans. How fast do they want to move? On the one hand, I think they do want some change. They do want to consolidate these, this improvement in relations. On the other hand, they're nervous that, you know, that if too much, too fast, uh, that that could cause um, you know, instability from their point of view. Uh, Obama, of course, also made it easier for American tourists to travel. Uh, he altered aspects of the, re of the uh, regulations. Uh, last year, about... Uh, 400,000 Cuban Americans. Cuban Americans can travel anytime they want, any, how often they want, no problem. Uh, so you've, see, you've seen a lot of, of uh, flights. There's hourly flights from Miami to Havana, mostly with Cuban Americans. But in addition, last year you had about 100,000 regular non-Cuban American Americans uh, traveling down under various categories that were allowed and under the liberalization of those categories. It's people to people. You pretty well have to go in groups. You're not supposed to have fun in Cuba. You're supposed to do people to people, have a whole program, discuss politics, economics, the arts, serious, no smiles allowed. Uh, and that's, that's the, that's, those are the regulations. Definitely you're not supposed to hang out on the beach. And according to some, some uh, regulations, you're not even supposed to go to a baseball game, which I find tragic. Uh, so uh, you've had a sudden spurt in uh, U.S. Uh, travel, uh, maybe up by 30, 40 percent. So I think that 100,000 will quickly rise to 200,000 or, or more. Uh, he's also made it easier to set for uh, Cuban Americans to send uh, remittances, to send money back to their families. Uh, right now, they, they have been sending, sending about $2 billion a year. Maybe that number will rise to about $3 billion. So that's an important source of foreign exchange, of course, for those families, but for the Cuban economy as a whole. So those have been continuing. What more might happen? Uh, might the administration make it easier to trade with a, a wider variety of groups? For example, there are joint ventures. Might it be possible to, to trade with joint ventures? Uh, further easing of the travel restrictions, another possibility. We'll see whether or not Obama wants another round of liberalization or not. I think that will depend on what happens in Cuba as well as his domestic political calculations. Uh, there is talk that if the situation continues to improve between the U.S. and Cuba and on the island, 
that perhaps before the end of his term, towards the end of his term, presumably, possibly the President of the United States might decide to make an official visit uh, to Cuba, which would be very dramatic. Uh, we'll see if that's, that decision, of course, would be made uh, in the White House. Thank you very much, Frank, and uh, I'm welcome to take your questions. Well, we thank you very much. That was a nice, comprehensive uh, treatment of the situation. We're in your debt for that. Um, I'll be repeating the questions today. Uh, Lane, I think you were first. The, uh, the question is whether our, this, this new interaction with uh, Cuba might uh, be an indicator of something with respect to Russia. Is that fair, Lane? Well, not an indicator, but might help the Russians uh, see us in a slightly better light. Uh, would, okay. Would, would, would the, the Cuban arrangements help Mr. Putin like us more? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, was extremely important uh, in the uh, foreign affairs and international diplomacy and economy of Cuba. Uh, they were providing many billions of dollars in subsidies every year. Uh, they, of course, provided the, uh, all their arms and weapons of all sorts. Some of you will remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, fascinating uh, a series of events, by the way. You know, from the point of view of most Americans, that was just Khrushchev being way too adventurous and trying to alter uh, the geopolitical and nuclear balance of power. And of course, we, we uh, President Kennedy looked, looked him eyeball to eyeball, and Khrushchev blinked, right? That's the basic interpretation. But that leaves out Cuba. And what was the Cuban piece of it? What had happened two years before the Cuban Missile Crisis? The Bay of Pigs. That is to say, the United States had sent, had sent uh, mer you know, mercenaries, that is to say, uh, Cuban Ameri Cuban Cubans, um, Cuban refugees, uh, we armed them and paid for it, and we set, and they inv tried to invade Cuba and overthrow the regime there. Of course, that, that failed. But uh, at the, when we did that, we also had the island. We had a lot of ships off the coast. Uh, we, from the point of view of Cuba, it looked like you know, we, were, we were planning not, you know, not only to have the, Cuban, the Cubans go forward, but you know, possibly launch a full-scale U.S. invasion. And uh, that was, although that failed, that was followed up by a whole series of very hostile activities, and uh, including a lot of military activities. So from the point of view of the Cubans and of the Soviets, the idea of a full-fledged U.S. invasion seemed like something that was quite possible, quite possible. So in the bargaining, so, so, so uh, Khrushchev places the missiles there. Why? OK, maybe in his head to alter the geopolitical balance, but also to make it impossible for the US to invade Cuba. Because the nuclear weapons would be a tripwire, just like we have the, the nuclear weapons as a tripwire in Western Europe back in the day. Uh, he would have his tripwire in Cuba. And that would safeguard the island of Cuba from a possible American attack. Part, we now know, as part of the agreement between Khrushchev and Kennedy, that Kennedy pledged, in writing, not to invade Cuba. And that was very much part of the deal. So uh, also to withdraw some uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles from Turkey. So although, yes, uh, Khrushchev blinked in the sense that he decided he agreed to pull, pull back, he did get something. He got, and he got two things, two concessions from the United States, one of which was not to invade Cuba. So from the point of view of the Cubans, uh, support from the Soviet Union meant not only an economic lifeline, it meant their guarantee of their very survival, that they would not be invaded by the United States. Then, so just to, to, to bring it up to the present, though, so then, of course, the Soviet Union collapses, and uh, the Cubans lose that subsidy. And the Cuban economy really takes a very, very deep dive. Uh, 30 to 40 percent decline in GDP. Uh, people really uh, were hungry. There was no petrol. Uh, 
Uh, people could not drive cars. People literally had to either walk to work, they, they quickly imported some Chinese bicycles or bicycle to work. I mean, things were very grave. The Cubans joked at that time, we only have three problems in Cuba, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was grave. And a lot of people thought the regime was gonna be overthrown. And in fact, uh, there was uh, a very unusual protest in Havana during those years. People on the street started to uh, you know, gather and uh, chant anti-Castro uh, slogans. And so Fidel himself boldly rushed down to that scene. And he said, who wants to throw a rock at Fidel Castro? Well, Fidel was always a very gutsy guy. And Fidel always, his response to, to an attack was always, escalate. Don't re and this is what the US had trouble grasping, and that's why we never dealt very successfully with him. He would not retreat, he would not compromise, he would escalate. So he goes down there and says, who will throw a rock at Fidel Castro? And the response of the crowd is to start chanting, viva Fidel, viva Fidel, viva Fidel. And that was the end of the demonstrations. So they got through that very difficult period, and then they, oh, they made a number of partial reforms. They allowed in tourism, which they had closed down, uh, a little bit of the private sector, et cetera. The dollar starts to circulate. Some foreign investment is allowed in. So in the mid-'90s, they, uh, they stabilized their economy, although at a lower level, but at least people still, they can get breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or at least breakfast and dinner. Um, the Soviets were pretty well out of there. They had withdrawn. Now, more recently, with Putin trying to be a little more assertive on a worldwide basis, uh, they've come in and they've said they want to sell a few, sell some commercial aircraft. You can fly directly, for example, from Havana to uh, Moscow. I actually took that flight once a couple of years ago, and I thought, wow, this is going to be really exciting. I bet there'll be so, all sorts of spies and people selling military hardware and stuff. You know who was on the plane? It was uh, people, Russians, but who worked for a Japanese pharmaceutical company, and they were on vacation in Cuba because they had all been, you know, won top salesman of the year. <laughs> that was it. Top salesman of the year. I thought, like, where are the spies and arms traffickers? <laughs> Or maybe I just didn't realize that's what they really were. <laughs> anyway, but I, but I don't, I don't, you know, the Russians really no longer have the capacity, I don't think, to be major players. And they're also cautious. You know, the Cubans have been deadbeats when it comes to repaying for loans. They've defaulted on everyone over the years, including on the Russians. The Russians have had to forgive most of the uh, credits. Uh, and so they'll do a little bit of business, but I don't think they'll do a lot of business. The Russians did applaud uh, Obama's... Um, uh, engagement with Cuba, they, as, as did everybody else, but they said, yeah, we, we think this is a, a, a favorable move. Comment on the status okay. of Guantanamo. So, c do any of you recall uh, the Spanish-American War? <laughs> no. A very young crowd here, Frank, a young crowd. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we invaded, of course, and we decided to keep uh, that naval base, which back in the day uh, when the Caribbean was seen as important in terms of maritime routes, that was considered a strategic location. And it was actually active during World War II. Uh, now the Navy no longer sees it as uh, strate strategically important, I think. Uh, my experience with the Navy is, uh, you know, they never like to give up any base if they, if they can avoid it. But I think that day will come. Uh, the... Uh, there is, uh, we have, the US military does interact regularly with the Cuban military to make sure there are no incidents to deal with any Cubans that might decide to jump the fence or whatever, and all of that is handled very collegially. Uh, so military to mil military relations are actually quite normal in this context. Uh, we of course do use Guantanamo these days you know, for other purposes, uh, and that's, uh, that's separate from uh, the purely Cuban aspect. Uh, it's not a high priority on the agenda. I think, you know, it's on the, uh, a, a remote part of the island. It's not, it's not like, you know, uh, some of our installations in uh, Korea or Japan, which are in urban centers and are very visible and therefore more controversial. This is way off in remote areas, so Cubans are not aware of it. They don't see it. So it's not a hot-button issue. And um, the Cuban government has said they want it returned. 
uh, but I don't think uh, you know it's it'll be it will eventually be discussed, but but later uh, we we do continue to send checks. I mean, the formal agreement was we're renting, but in perpetuity. But Fidel, that wily guy, keeps the checks, but he does not cash them. <laughs> so, because he says that would admit that he would consider it leg a legitimate relationship, which he says it, it is not. So there must be a drawer somewhere uh, in, in his office someplace that was just a pile of these US government checks. <laughs> How powerful is the uh, uh, conservative Cuban lobby um, on the question of recognition? Yeah, so that's a fascinating question. And uh, you know, often when, whenever I travel, people ask me, well, what, what do Americans think or to talk about US politics? And I say, you know, there are like 330 million Americans and far be it for me to generalize and I really haven't the slightest idea what your average American thinks. It's also very hard to really understand what go, what's going on in Capitol Hill these days uh, because uh, <laughs> Uh, the political parties are so fragmented. Uh, you know, it's not like there's clear leadership uh, that would tell you where, what, in what directions things are, things are likely to go. Uh, we've had an important change in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I think one reason, I think there are a number of reasons the administration decided to move this December. One of them was, ironically, the Republicans taking the Senate kicked Robert Menendez off the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And Menendez is a Democrat right from New Jersey, but he's also Cuban-American and a real ferocious hardliner. As long as he chaired the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it was more difficult. Uh, because not only would he stop any legislation the administration might want, but he would link things. And he would say flat out, if you do anything Cuba I don't like, I'm going to wreck your Iran policy. That's the sort of you know, really street tough, thuggy guy that Bob Menendez is. He's out. Uh, also, he's under, about to be under indictment, so he's, <laughs> he's from New Jersey, you know. <laughs> this, ha this, is this happens. <laughs> uh, so, and Bob Corker from Tennessee, who has no equities in, on the Cuba issue, he, he's sort of very even-handed, he doesn't take a strong position. So that's, that's eased things, at least in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The opposition, uh, you know, the, the, the few Cuba, uh, well, Public opinions polls show that your average Cuban American uh, in Florida, New Jersey, and elsewhere um, is essentially supportive of the administration's policies. Mainly, they like the ability to travel, to send remittances. The, uh, the, the rejoining the, of the, uh, the reunification of the Cuban family, they respond to that humanitarian aspect of it. Uh, the younger people would also say, hey, 50 years of hostility from my grandfather, I mean, let, let's move on, right? But there still is a constituency, minority perhaps, but still a constituency for this sort of hardline policy. Uh, and they've, they've tried to uh, promote various amendments critical of the administration policy that, that are floating around in the, in the House. But at least uh, people that I know that work on the Hill and that are able to follow these issues very closely doubt that any of that legislation will ultimately prosper. On the other hand, could the administration move forward its own legislation which would uh, poke further holes in the embargo, you know, further liberalize trade, open up trade, maybe, maybe, maybe with joint ventures, uh, et cetera. And I think uh, that remains to be seen. There are, there are also some pieces of legislation floating around uh, you have on the, let's say, pro-administration side, uh, you have most of the Democrats, you, but you also have uh, uh, farm-based Republicans uh, who, are in f who want to sell more you know, agricultural products, and you have the Chamber of Commerce, which, has been very, you know, which in general doesn't like economic sanctions, uh, also lobbying very hard uh, for further opening. So the Republican Party, and then also within the Republican Party, you have the, uh, let's say, the laissez-faire uh, wing of the party, uh, which, which also doesn't like sanctions and particularly doesn't think that the U.S. government should interfere with the freedom to travel. So uh, the Republican Party is very fragmented. So that, that's why I think you're not going to get antagonistic legislation, uh, but whether the administration can move th forward some of its own agenda on the Hill, uh, that's, that's a hard slog, remains to be seen. What are the relations between Cuba and China? So Cuba... Uh, it's important to understand sometimes when, you t when one talks about the U.S. embargo, one might have the image in their head of 
an island surrounded by U.S. naval forces in which the Cubans are cut off from the world. It's really a, a quite the reverse. What we have is U.S. ships surrounding the United States, preventing U.S. firms uh, from engaging with Cuba. But the whole rest of the world, and I mean the entire rest of the world, without exception, has normal diplomatic and economic relations with Cuba. What uh, the main constraint on, on trade and investment with Cuba with the rest of the world is that the, the island's economy is not very good. Uh, but, uh, you know, Mexico, Brazil, China, Thailand, uh, the European companies, the Canadian companies, uh, they do normal business with Cuba. Do you know how many Canadian tourists go to Cuba every year, mostly in the winter? Yeah, I mean, the population of Canada is about 33 million. Uh, out of that 33 million, a million Canadians go down there every year to, and have been doing this for a number of years just to get a little sun and surf, you know, and get away from the really, you know, unpleasantly cold winters up there. So uh, the whole world is open uh, to Cuba other than we, us. So we, we're, we're really the outlier on this. Now, in terms of China, so uh, the, uh, the Chinese Revolution uh, initially was enthusiastic, Che Guevara, you know, uh, but then once the Soviets uh, became their closest ally and then relations deteriorated between the Soviets and the Chinese, the Chinese were on the outs, right? Um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the growing strength of the Chinese economy, the Chinese have moved in somewhat. And they have provided some loans and some small investments. But then in, uh, and if you, if you go to visit the island, you'll see a lot of the buses uh, are uh, uh, hutong buses, you know, buses made in China. Um, but in, when the Cuban economy had some problems in 2008, they said to the Chinese, so sorry, so sorry, we can't pay you back for your loans. And the Chinese said, well, well how about the contracts that we signed? And the Cubans said, we, we thought that was socialist solidarity. Uh, <laughs> no, the Chinese said, contracts, we expect actually to be paid back. The Cubans go, really? <laughs> Haven't you followed our, the history of our commercial policies? We never pay back. <laughs> So since then, the Chinese have hesitated to, uh, to offer a lot in the way of credits. They're unhappy that ref economic reform has not proceeded uh, more rapidly and deeply in Cuba. Is there a next generation of leadership? Uh, so uh, in terms of decision making, it's a communist party. There's a Politburo, 15 people. Uh, we know who they are. Those names are public. They most of them tend to be of the Castro generation, you know, what they refer to as the, uh, the orthodox or the authenticos, or the heroes of the revolution. I mean, many of them guys who literally, when they were young, you know, ran around with rifles in the countryside. Uh, and they're s still, you know, running the show. So it's still a, a tight decision-making process, top-down Politburo. Next generation, uh, we as foreigners, uh, have little to no access to uh, the senior people, even at the next level. Uh, so we can just pick up a little bit that we get, you know, through Cuban friends or whatever. Uh, there is a first vice president whose name is Miguel Diaz Canel. Diaz Canel. He's in his early 50s. He's considered likely to be the presidential candidate and hence the next president of Cuba. Uh, he's supposed to be. Uh, a smart guy, uh, relatively speaking, open-minded. Uh, he will occasionally meet with uh, senior American delegations, usually uh, senators, although in, in very formal settings. He does walk around with uh, a computer tablet, and that people think, oh, that means he's a modern guy and likes technology. Uh, he does have a background in engineering. So, uh, but we don't know a lot. And I, I think it's a mistake to assume that because these people would be younger, that they're therefore going to be a lot more liberal. Uh, you know, to succeed in the Communist Party, you have to have adhered to the Communist Party line uh, your whole life. Now, what do these people think deep down in their heart of hearts? You know, that's really very hard to know. The Cuban foreign minister uh, is a youngish guy. I think he's in his mid-40s. And, you know, I, he foreigners do meet with. I've met with him in, any number of times. And he very much adheres to the line of the day. 
Uh, he's, I mean, so I don't know really if he's more, let's say, progressive or not. Uh, he's, he's very careful not to show his cards if, in fact, he is. So um, uh, younger people, that is to say people in their, in their teens and 20s and, and 30s, most of those people, I'd say, definitely want to see change. Uh, in fact, a lot of them leave the island. And this is one of the big, one of the, if you would ask me why did Raul decide to move forward and, be, and begin a process of change, I think because he saw his grandchildren and the, the, the children and grandchildren of his friends leaving the island. Uh, some coming to the U.S., others moving to Spain or to, to Mexico or, or, or other parts of Europe or Canada. And that, was, of course, is very disheartening. Some of that's inevitable. If you're a small island in the Caribbean, there's going to be out-migration. Uh, but Cuba was losing a lot of its best and the brightest. And uh, so there is that frustration and discontent among the younger people, without a doubt. The question is, was Fidel Castro, and is Fidel Castro, an agrarian reformer rather than a communist? Okay, well, this is a very sophisticated question, and uh, there is no uh, obvious yes or no response. Uh, it's very hard to know uh, the actual evolution of Fidel Castro's ideology. Uh, what did he believe when? Uh, these things are, you know, there's a, there's a lot of debate uh, uh, over, over these issues. Um, the... Um, he did early on, uh, it, well, he certainly wanted an agrarian reform, and he said that's what he was going to do at the time of the Mankato attack in 1953. So he was on the record. Everybody knew about that. Uh, but he did say he would hold elections, uh, and the Cuba would, he would go back to the 1940 Constitution. The Cuba would basically be a liberal democracy. Uh, he didn't say anything about closing it down to the world or anything like that. Uh, there is no doubt that under the Eisenhower administration, we're talking about the end of the Eisenhower administration now, um, but, but the, the US bureaucracy as a whole uh, rejected the idea of agrarian reform uh, just by itself, irrespective of what Fidel may or may not have believed in his head. And we know that first from the record of what was done within the administration uh, when it began to oppose uh, firmly Fidel but we also know what happened in Guatemala in 1954. And that's very relevant. Uh, in 1954, a guy named Arbenz gets elected. And he begins to, uh, he does expropriate some large uh, plantations, uh, some of whom, which were owned by uh, American uh, you know, capitalists, some of whom were very close to very senior people in the US government. And Arbenz even offered compensation but the US government said, that's not enough. And, and this is all very public information now. Uh, the, the, the CIA was sent down there, worked with the Guatemalan military, and put together uh, a coup and ousted Arbenz. And it looked like a big victory, right? Yeah, we can make things happen. We can get rid of these sort of... Arbenz himself wasn't accused of being a communist, but there were communists in his cabinet or around him, whatever. That plus the agrarian reform, unacceptable to American foreign policy. So it looked like a, a really quick and easy success by the United States. Arbenz, gone. Uh, situation in Guatemala deteriorated, but that wasn't the main point. From a geopolitical point of view, we had stopped the spread of unpleasant ideas. Who was there in Guatemala at the time? Che Guevara. Che concluded, and also, there, and there are pictures of this showing um, Fidel himself, I mean, every, you know, the whole political world in, in Latin America was very aware of what had happened in Guatemala. Of course, most Americans would have had no idea, probably, but people in Latin America really knew about it. And they concluded that any attempt at serious social reform in Latin America would be met by ferocious hostility by the United States, to the point of uh, encouraging, arming, and organizing coups against it. So that, when uh, Che, but also Fidel, come to power, they completely assume that the United States is going to jump down their throat early on. And therefore, they decided they had to organize the people uh, at every level. That is to say, they created uh, you know, armed militias. They had uh, civil defense in every neighborhood, which was a way to figure out who was for you and who was against you. 
and who you could arm when the moment came. And they were correct, because we, we did try to do the same thing with the Bay of Pigs. But unlike Arbenz, who was caught unprepared, the Cuban revolutionaries were prepared, and they snuffed out the Bay of Pigs with ease. So, if, if we may. Yeah, so, 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 my, so, my, so my point here is that uh, the agrarian reform part was certainly a big part of uh, what Fidel was doing, and that was enough to get the United States very upset. He did then move on to, let's say, more traditional, and he declared himself Marxist-Leninist. Uh, and, and he then takes over not just an agrarian reform, he takes over the entire economy. Uh, industry, commerce, uh, even small-scale business, and he has an urban reform in which he essentially takes over all property, period. Uh, so he goes a lot further than agrarian reform. Now, whether he would have done that inevitably, or whether that was in reaction to uh, uh, U.S. hostility, those are very difficult uh, historical scenarios to, to know what, what might have happened if, what would have been the counterfactual. Uh, these things are, 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 these are the mysteries of history. Is Canada perhaps a template uh, for our modification of policy? Uh, the Canadians, by the way, uh, played some role in brokering the negotiations between the Obama administration and the Castro administration. A lot of the, we do know that uh, some of the negotiation, negotiating sessions were held in Canada. So uh, Canada, uh, partly to differentiate itself from the United States, partly because they desperately need some place to go in the cold winters. Uh, so you have some Canadian businesses down there. Uh, these tour agencies, of course. You, uh, the major uh, nickel, there's a, big, there's a lot of nickel mining in Cuba, and uh, a Canadian company called Sherit is the has joint ventures down there. And so uh, Canadian nickel is mined in Canada, is shipped up to a refinery in Alberta, refined, and then shipped to China. Incre how, how, how crazy is that? Uh, and, uh, and you have a couple of other, you have some, some of the hotels or, so in other words, they have some business interests as well as the tourism. Uh, they do try to advance democracy and human rights in sort of conversations. They support uh, some independent artists and theater uh, and things like that. Um, you know, I don't think they would recognize that they have not had that much success on the political side. Uh, you know, some, some, some favorable results, but you know, they certainly haven't been able to alter the nature of the regime fundamentally. Uh, but they do have a certain business and diplomatic presence. Unfortunately, I have no control over the movement of the clock. It is 10 minutes after 7, which is our bewitching hour. So let me thank uh, our distinguished guests. Thank you. Marvelously informational.